Gothic is an international style. It developed in the Ile de France, that's the area around Paris, about 1140, the 1140s, and it spread to Germany, England, the Netherlands, Spain, and even to Italy. Now, the first German church we're going to talk about is Strasbourg, or Strasbourg Cathedral. The west facade was designed, we know who designed it, who the uh, mason was, is Erwan von Steinbach. And that began about 12, well, it began in 1277. Uh, they were working on this church from the 1240s, clear into the 15th century, where the towers, uh, the tower is, uh, comes into being. But what we'll be looking at mostly is the 13th century church. Now, I said it was Strasbourg or Strasbourg Cathedral. And some of you may be saying, well, wait a minute, isn't Strasbourg in France? It's in Alsace. Alsace is uh, the area that today is in France, it's in eastern France, uh, which is just adjacent to Germany. And it has changed hands between France and Germany a number of times during history. Um, during the Middle Ages, period we're talking about, uh, it was German speaking. Now remember, there's not a nation state German, and there's not a, and so you know Germany is ruled by different uh, princes and bishops uh, in various places. Um, but Alsace had been part of the Frankish territory going back to the Frankish Empire, and then became uh, part of the Carolingian Empire. So here we're back in the 8th and 9th centuries. Um, when did Alsace become French? Well, the Thirty Years' War in the 17th century. And then, I'm not going to go into all the history of it going back and forth between different countries. Uh, today, Alsace is in France, but many of the towns uh, still have uh, uh, German sounding names. And when we talk about some of the artists who are from Alsace, uh, such as in the 15th century, uh, Martin Schungauer from Colmar, we say he's a German artist. Because he's living in the 15th century, it became French in the 17th century. So today, it's French. But in the period that we're talking about in the Middle Ages, it was, it was German speaking territory. And that's why you have two spellings of the name. One with the U in it is the French spelling, and Strasbourg is the German spelling. Now, this church is Notre Dame du Strasbourg, or Unser Liebe Frau von Strasbourg. Uh, it was begun in the 1140s. The nave was completed by, excuse me, it was begun in the 1240s. It was begun in the 1240s, the 13th century. The nave was completed by 1275. And as we said, the west facade dates from 1277. Uh, and we know the designer, the mason, uh, today we call him the architect, uh, Erwin von Steinbach. Now, the upper section is later. So you can sort of see, uh, if you look down the street, you, it's really hard to get a picture of the whole facade of Strasbourg Cathedral. Um, because if you're standing on the ground, uh, you're going to be looking down this market street. And as you can see, you can only see one of the portals at the bottom. And uh, the buildings on either side block the view. There is a uh, piazza, I'll use the Italian term, uh, an opening in the city uh, right out in front of it. But you can't, I, I'm standing on the ground, you can't get back far enough to take the picture of the whole facade. Um, but you can see that there's levels. You have the doorway level and there's a a molding that goes across horizontally, and then you have the rose window, and then, then there is an, another molding, and also a whole series of, ar of arcade, 
uh, up above, and then the upper part is of above that. And as you can say, that's very open. And then the tower, they obviously probably planned a two tower facade, but the second tower never got built. Uh, the tower was erected in the 15th century. Um, but we're going to look at uh, mostly at the 13th century building. Now, we said that the west facade was designed by Erwin von Steinbach, and it's in the rayonette style. You'll remember we talked about different styles of French Gothic architecture, and this, co this corresponds to the rayonette style um, where the stonework is becoming thinner. Uh, it's the high Gothic style from the 13th century. Uh, more openings, more glass. Now, you actually had a building here, an old, the old facade. So what did von Steinbach do? He built his facade over the old facade. And it's filled with tracery. Tracery are the um, designs in stonework. Of course, you can also have wooden tracery, for example, in a frame of a painting. But uh, they are the, the solid uh, decorations uh, that you have uh, all over the surface of the church. And so they say it's a tracery screen over the old facade. It just covers up the old facade, and what you see is rayonette high gothic. Uh, at the lower level, there are three portals, as you see the large one in the center. Uh, and the two smaller ones on either side. Uh, they have these vertical gables. You may remember something like that from uh, Rems Cathedral. And we have a rayonet rose window with a thin bar tracery. Of course, this is filled with stained glass, and you can see the tracery is the stonework. You know, uh, very decorative, you know, forming patterns. And this is the rayonette rose window from the interior. So you can see the, uh, how the, the colors of the glass would show up and how the stonework is, you know, it's not plate tracery anyway. It's, it's open. You have a lot more glass and the stonework forms. Um, it's almost like the edge of the petals of the rose, if, in a sense. And uh, here's a detail. So you can see uh, some of the leading and some of the intricacy of the uh, stained glass window. Okay, well that gives you an idea when, when it had all its glass, you know, what, what that glass would have been like. The nave was completed 1275, high Gothic style, granite style. Uh, and you can see a lot of the things that we've seen before in French churches. This is obviously influenced by that. Uh, you have the three levels, the arcade, the Triforium, and a very large Clare story. Uh, you have the pointed ribbed vaults. And you might notice, if you look at this picture, uh, you can see through the arches of the Triforium, and there's glass behind them. Not the arcade that's right at the uh, wall of the nave. That's you know, open. But behind it is are glass windows. And you have glass windows, of course, in the Clare story and in the, uh, the side aisles. And there, we're looking again, and you can see this also, that you have large windows in the Clare story, uh, and you have windows even behind the Triforium. Uh, Strasbourg also has flying buttresses. And as you can see, they're fairly solid flying buttresses. Uh, but they do extend from the wall of the upper nave beside the clerestory to the buttresses that are attached to the wall of the uh, side aisle. And you can also see the pinnacles on top that uh, give extra weight, sort of hold it down, if you will. And now we want to look at the portals. Um, that's how you take pictures of it to be, because you have to sort of be off to the side in the raking view. Um, and we're going to look at the south portal on the west side. 
the west side, the west end is usually the entrance. And that's, we talk about all these churches and when we say the west end, it's the entrance end. So we're looking at the west side or the west facade. Um, and then to our right, as we face it, uh, would be the south portal. And we want to look at some of the sculpture in there. The theme of this doorway is the Last Judgment. And there is a tympana where you see the Last Judgment and sort of Christ up there in the tippy top of the, uh, of the pinnacle. Uh, and then the, uh, it's like the damned are being thrown into a hell mouth. And down below you have the resurrection of the dead. But the part we're going to look at are the jam statues. Notice you have these four, four statues on each side, uh, on either side of the doorway. And they all have their own little pedestal and canopy over them. And these are the wise and foolish virgins. Now, you'll remember that the wise and foolish virgins um, was a theme that we talked about when we were discussing the Rosano Gospels. And that this was a parable of the Last Judgment or a parable of the Second Coming of Christ. It's told in Matthew 25, verses 1 through 13. And you know, Jesus says that the kingdom of heaven is, you know, like this wedding celebration where the maidens are waiting uh, with their lamps and they're going to accompany the bridegroom to the bridal chamber. Well, the very prudent, wise virgins brought extra, la uh, extra lamp oil. Uh, you know, they realized that they didn't know how long it was going to be, and they might run out of oil, so they brought extra. The foolish virgins didn't think of that. And when their lights burned out, their lamps burned out, they had to leave to go buy more oil. But when they returned, the brighter, bridal procession had already passed, and so they went to the, where the bridal feast was being held, and they knocked on the doors, and they were denied entrance. The parable warns Christ's followers to be prepared for the second coming when the last judgment will occur because no one knows when the bridegroom, a metaphor for Christ, will come. And it also separating them into the foolish and wise virgins um, is like the separation of the, the damned and the blessed. Uh, I, they usually say the wise and foolish virgins, and you'll notice on my heading, I switched it uh, because the foolish virgins are over here on the left as we're facing them, and uh, the wise virgins are on the right. Now, to me, that seems a little odd because we usually arrange these things from the way Christ is showing. Uh, but here, it's the viewers left and right. Um, and we're going to take a look uh, particularly at two of these figures. You may notice just looking at this that there are different uh, ways of representing the figures, possibly different hands uh, in the workshop. And uh, we're going to look at the ones uh, on some of the foolish virgins. And you'll notice that there's this handsome, crowned young man there who is generally identified as Satan. That's interesting. Sometimes he's just called the tempter. And you may notice, um, the. I think you can see this, that the two virgins who are closer at the doorway, uh, they're holding their lamps upside down to show that there's no more oil in them. But the figures we want to look at are the male figure and the uh, foolish virgin right next to him. Um, they're pretty interesting. They're pretty, they're pretty fun, actually. Okay. This shows the tempter, Satan, as a handsome youth, very debonair, with a crown and fashionable clothing. He's 
considered to be a tempter to the young ladies. Uh, and he's also holding up, it's like he's examining an apple. And of course, that is a reference to the fruit of original sin. And here we see him in profile. You know, with this one's clearly an apple. There's no question that it would be uh, an orb or anything like that. Uh, but he's, you know, he's this very elegant guy with the curled hair and uh, uh, beautiful garments. And uh, you might notice that the little maiden right next to him is flirting with him. I mean, she doesn't know he's Satan. And he's just a tempter for foolish young ladies. And uh, here you see the facial expressions, you know, the high cheekbones and the kind of grin and the little tipped head that the maiden has. I mean, you know, she's, she's obviously giving him the eye, as it were. And he's examining the apple. Now, how do we know he's Satan? I mean, just holding, a, holding an apple, you know, why, he's beautifully dressed. Why, not, why isn't he the bridegroom or one of the bridegroom's friends? Well, let's look a little closer at him. You might not see this, but behind him, you know, there's a slit in his garment and you can see these toads and snakes uh, that are hidden from the maidens. But uh, if you look very, very closely, you know, you'll see, you know, the viewer can see his true nature. And so here we see him in profile and some more details of the snakes that are crawling up him. There's a little, uh, little lizard-like creature, perhaps, a little snake anyway, and then there's toads. Yeah, that's, that's a snake. And they're just, uh, you know, supposed to be animals that they might associate with, with Satan, uh, with evil. So that gives him a way, but uh, certainly one of the more imaginative ways of showing the last judgment uh, and the story of the wise and foolish virgins. Okay, when we go along to the south side of the church, there is this double portal. And we're going to look at some of the sculpture that was from this portal. Now, um, as far as the jam statues go, they have been moved inside the church and they have replicas up in place. Uh, we're going to look at the sculpture on the tympana on the left and the two jam statues. See these uh, figures on the far sides of your image. The subject of the tympana on the left is the Dormition of the Virgin, and the jam statues represent the church and the synagogue. So let's look first at the Dormition of the Virgin. This is usually dated about uh, 1230, and of course it's in a lunette shape, you know, or half circle, rounded top. Um, the term Dormition means the sleep of the Virgin. You may remember when we talked about Byzantine art, uh, we talked about the church at Daphne, uh, which was the church of the Dormition of the Virgin. So the word means sleep, but that's a euphemism. Uh, it's referring to the death of the Virgin Mary. And at the time of the death of the Virgin Mary, uh, the apostles gathered together, you know, to be by her bedside and Christ, comes down from heaven to take her soul to heaven. And so here you see uh, Christ standing amidst the other apostles, and he has what almost looks like a little doll uh, on his hand, uh, standing up very straight with her hands together. That's the soul of the Virgin Mary. That's how they're going to show the soul as a, a little figure. Uh, he is blessing, uh, and the blessing gesture is you know, going out to the viewer. Uh, his head is uh, tipped as he's you know, looking down at his mother. And you might take a look at those drapery folds, uh, how you know, they really do define the body. In this Dormition of the Virgin, Mary Magdalene is also present. And she's there right there in the front, uh, you know, wringing her hands. And you'll notice that the figures are you know, they're close together and yet they're very deeply cut. 
And there's a strong emotional figure here. Uh, the heads are large, so you can see the facial expressions. Uh, they have various gestures, and I point out Mary Magdalene's gesture, for example, uh, the two apostles on either end who uh, seem to embrace or lift, perhaps, uh, the Virgin. Um, and you know, there are individual facial expressions. So you have you know, that emotionalism that we often associate with German art, but you also have something else. You have the influence of classical antiquity. Uh, look at the drapery folds. That's what I said before. Look at the drapery folds. Uh, and the drapery folds seem to wrap the body. They bunch. They cling to the body. Uh, and when I say they bunch, by this I mean they're not just parallel lines. Drapery folds don't follow just in you know, parallel arcs or something like that. Uh, so, you know, it's Believable, think back to Rem, uh, Rem's jam statues, uh, where you had the visitation figures, and in many ways very similar, uh, you know, a lot of myriad of lots of little drapery folds. It's not the same hand, but it's an artist who has evidently seen some classical statuary, or perhaps, you know, has been trained by somebody who's seen some classical statuary. You might also take a look at the heads of the Virgin Mary and Mary Magdalene, and how classical they look. Um, you know, they've got the round jaw and the regular features of uh, Roman matrons. In fact, you know, the Virgin Mary looks very much like a Roman matron uh, with the draperies that wrap her body, and you can see how the uh, her stole is going over her arm, and yet we can still see the outlines of her arm. So this is very interesting because it's got classical influence, and it's also got, you know, what we say, German emotionalism, uh, and, and the big heads so that you can see the features. Now, when you look at the whole thing, of course, you have the rhythmic movement and texture, all that, all those drapery folds or the way the figures lean over. Uh, they all form rhythms of the repeated curving lines. And then you have patterns in the beards and the hair and the drapery. And as I said, that the figures do appear to be solid. They're, they're, um, you know, they all have to fit within the lunette, but it looks like there's a lot of space behind. The background has been deeply cut out, so the figures do seem to uh, what emerge. We have two jam statues. Now it looks like there's four. That's because there's slightly different views. Uh, and so they've taken one picture and then one uh, just slightly different of each figure. Um, these represent the church, ecclesia, and the synagogue, synagoga. And they are the jam statues of the south transept portal. And here we're looking at them close up, so you can see some of the detail. Uh, you'll notice that uh, the church is holding a chalice and a long staff surmounted by a cross with a banner around it, we're often talk about the banner of the resurrection. Uh, she is standing erect and she has a crown. While the synagogue is looking downward, has a blindfold around her eyes, and has a broken spear. Here we see them both together. We're going to talk more about the iconography, but first let's notice the style. Now these are both very elongated. In other words, they're tall and slender. Uh, if you're talking about the proportions of the body, they have small heads uh, compared to their long body. And this makes them very elegant and courtly. And you might notice how uh, they lean to one side, so they have this uh, beautiful arc. Uh, the drapery folds fall naturally. Uh, their figures are sort of cinched in uh, at the waist and then going to below the waist, and the draperies fall and then make a nice little uh, puddle of uh, drapery folds at the bottom. And as the figures turn, uh, you, you feel like there is a potential for movement. You know, that they could uh, continue to do something else. They're not, uh, you know, stiff in place that, uh, you know, they look like they're part of the architecture. They're on the architecture, but they also uh, look like complete statues on their own.
Now, we've actually seen some examples previously in this course about this contrast between the church and the synagogue. And of course, the iconography is the medieval Christian view. Um, they had a very negative view of the synagogue, of Judaism, as representative Judaism. Uh, and they believed that the new law of grace superseded the old Hebraic law of Moses. It does seem odd, in a way, that the Christians who believe that Jesus, who was definitely Jewish, was God's son. And they believe that he is God. And his mother and the apostles and you know, many of the saints of the early church were all Jewish. So what happened? Well, one thing that happened was um, competition in the early church between Christians and Jews for the, the same convent, or the con same converts. Uh, later on, Judaism was forbidden to convert anyone. And I think it's about 395, Theodosius makes Christianity the only legal religion in the Roman Empire. Often the medieval Christians thought that, you know, they'd heard everything about you know, Christianity from the time they were born. They just couldn't understand that people wouldn't accept it. So they thought that, uh, you know, that they, they were just being stubborn. <laughs> uh, and there were horrible persecutions of the Jews. Um, there were times when there would be riots that would wipe, wipe out the Jewish community, or it's a good part of it, uh, in various places. Some of the worst heresy hunting and um, destruction of minority religions, such as Judaism, uh, actually took place in the period that we call the Renaissance, or in the 15th and 16th century. There were times uh, during the Middle Ages in certain cities where the Jews and the Christians lived peacefully together. This often ended, sometimes it might be like for centuries in peace, and then um, the hatred of the Jews would come forth. So you're going to expect that they will have a very negative view of the, the synagogue. And uh, let me assure you, this is not my view. <laughs> um, the church is shown triumphant. Um, she is a personification of the church, Ecclesia. Uh, she is erect. She has a crown, and as we said, she holds a cross with the banner of the resurrection uh, and the chalice. And the chalice, of course, refers to the mass, the Eucharist, the wine of the mass, uh, which is a saving sacrament. Uh, it reenacts uh, the sacrifice of Christ's crucifixion. Uh, it's believed to create merits for the souls of the faithful. And sometimes the chalice is used as, an ex as a kind of symbol to refer to faith, for, to the Christian faith, for example. The synagogue, or synagogue, is blindfolded. Uh, the Christians of the Middle Ages would say that they simply do not see the truth of Christianity. Uh, she looks downward. Uh, the body twists around, and uh, her staff, which seems to be a lance or a spear, perhaps, is broken. Now, her left hand is holding what seem to be the tablets of Mosaic Law, like the Ten Commandments are on these tablets. Uh, and her head, you know, looks down toward them, although she's blindfolded. So, the way they're held suggests, you know, that you know, that down below, uh, say, the chalice that's held by uh, the church. So it's as though it suggests that the old law of Moses is superseded by the new covenant or the grace of uh, Christ. But she's a beautiful lady, isn't she? <laughs> a beautiful, graceful figure. Okay, I want to talk to you about a church. Um, it's a fairly small church. But it's in Marburg in Germany. Uh, it's the Church of St. Elizabeth of Hungary, and this is another 13th century church, uh, 1235 to 83. And here we're seeing the outside of the church. Unfortunately, there's a tree there, so it's a little hard to see uh, the nave. Um, 
Saint Elizabeth of Hungary is a very popular saint, uh, not only in Germany, uh, but uh, no, throughout Europe. Um, and she was canonized in 1235, and originally her relics were in this church. Um, they no longer are, they've been moved. So what? Well, they got busy and uh, built a church uh, to house her relics and to be dedicated to her. Uh, so it, you know, it would have probably started after she was canonized in 1235, and then the church was dedicated in 1283, which gives us a you know, pretty firm date. Now, this is what is known as a hall church. We've talked about the hall church of St. Savant sur Gartemp in the Romanesque period. Hall churches were very popular in the German Gothic. Uh, in the German Gothic period. Uh, here we're looking at uh, the facade with the two towers. As you can see, one uh, entrance into the west. This is not a, a huge, huge, uh, it's not a cathedral. It uh, it's actually was the Teutonic Knights Church. The church was, the towers were not finished until almost 100 years later, or about 100 years later, uh, in three, uh, 1340. But what's really interesting about this church is the interior. We said it is a hall church. Now, a hall church has a one-story elevation. In other words, you have the arcade rising up to the springing of the vaults. You don't have a triforium or a gallery or, or a clerestory. Uh, the piers rise to the vault. And if you have side aisles, the side aisles are the same height as the nave. And here we see we do have side aisles. We'll see that on the plan in a moment. And here we're in the church and you can sort of look uh, through the great arches to the side aisles where you know, obviously it's very, very open and you have uh, two levels of windows, but not a story to walk around in or uh, there. So it's lofty, it's open, and these were very, very good for preaching. Now this is not a Dominican or Franciscan church, but the Dominicans and the Franciscan orders were both growing at this time in the 13th century, uh, and they were preaching orders. Uh, they were known as mendicant orders because they, uh, they would go out and preach and they would go out and beg. Uh, hence the mendicant orders and, and travel around. Um, in this case, though, this is not Dominican and it's not uh, Franciscan. It is, as we said, the Teutonic Knights, which were uh, an order originally associated with the Crusades. They would aid, aid pilgrims um, who were going to uh, visit the Holy Land. Uh, and of course, um, they, they did remain uh, even after the Holy Land was no longer, uh, it wasn't very easy to get to the Holy Land after the, uh, the uh, uh, Christian um, conquering uh, had been what, reconquered by the Islamic forces. Uh, but the, the order did continue. Uh, the plan is really a cruciform plan. Uh, the apse, of course, and the two transepts are rounded. And you can see there's a single side aisle with the groin vault. Uh, and we know from looking at the image we just saw that the uh, the aisles are as tall as the hallway down the middle. Now this type of church, the Hall Church, was very popular in Germany and they built many of them during the Gothic period. However, the church we're going to look at next uh, is much influenced by French Gothic churches. So it's more on the um, pattern of the French Gothic that we've seen before. This is the very famous Cologne Cathedral or Colner Dome. Cologne is, of course, Cologne. Uh, and Dome means cathedral. It doesn't have to have a dome with rounded shape or the top. Uh, you may also know the same thing in Italy, uh, the Duomo. Of Florence, for example, the word refers both to the dome, but it also refers to the cathedral. So here we have a uh, Kölner dome. Once again, you know, we know uh, the architect uh, from the 1248 
you know, uh, campaign uh, plan, uh, not obviously the whole time, because as you can see, uh, this church was erected uh, over many centuries. But the basic church is 1248 uh, and to 1560. Uh, and then, and we'll, we'll tell you a little bit about how that developed, um, the facade had not been finished. And in the 19th century, they discovered the medieval plan. There was a drawing. And um, they solicited funds and they erected this great Gothic facade uh, in the late 19th century from about 1880 on. So here we see an aerial view of Colner Dome. Uh, the designer, the mason, was Master Gerhardt who designed the plan from 1248 and began the Gothic structure. Uh, he laid the foundations. And this is large church. Uh, it's 472 feet long, uh, 150 feet high. So it begun in 1248. Uh, the choir was consecrated in 1322. Uh, but then the work, and. You see pictures such as Hans Memling's um, Ursula Shrine, where in the background you'll see uh, the great crane that was lifting up the stones to finish the choir. So we know that you know they were working on the choir, uh, you know, uh, even after I guess the uh, the consecration in 1322, because that, that's a 15, uh, excuse me, a 14th painting, 15th century painting. Um, the work stopped. In 1560, without completing the facade, uh, and it wasn't until the 19th century that they uh, completed the church by placing this facade. This beautiful, I mean, it looks, I mean, it looks like, like a Gothic facade, uh, even though it was erected later. It's completely in the Gothic style. And you can see the, you know, the tracery, the pinnacles, uh, the verticality of the, uh, the different uh, openings, and of course the, the great towers uh, and the pinnacles over the doorways. The plan is basically cruciform. Uh, it may remind you of some of the French Gothic churches like Amiens, although its um, transepts uh, stick out just a little bit further. Um, so you have a five five aisles uh, in the, what, the, the vertical, as you're looking at here, the long way, the longitudinal uh, way of the um, church. So you have the nave and two side aisles on either side. Uh, and then when you get to the transept, there's the nave and one uh, aisle on either side of the uh, main aisle going down the middle. Uh, and then it resumes, for the choir, it resumes uh, the double side aisles. Uh, and you can also see that the um, radiating chapels are all linked. They share one wall. So there's this Gothic unity. And there is uh, an entrance area, a narthex, uh, on the west end. Uh, the choir, and you know, we start out with that word apse, uh, which can be very simple, and then we add on to it, uh, the, and we talk about the word choir, presumably because uh, the, this area is where the choir of monks would have sat, um, and then it's used much more generically for, you know, just for the eastern end of the church with uh, the, the high altar. Uh, the French word that's often used is chevet. So I give you that word as well, the seven radiating chapels there. And here we're looking upward uh, at the vertical towers. Now, Cologne Cathedral, I said it's much influenced by French architecture. So essentially you're having kind of ranet architecture in Germany. And uh, here we have two views. One is from the side, the uh, south portal, the uh, south transept entrance. Uh, and then you see the choir on the exterior, so the eastern end. This is said to have the first flying buttresses in Germany. 
And you can see clearly the influence of the French Gothic churches, uh, say, such as Amiens, you know, or any of the other high Gothic churches. But here we're uh, looking down into the uh, flying buttresses. And you also see the pinnacles, uh, sort of little, little towers at the uh, where the buttresses are that sort of uh, anchor them in place, give them uh, more weight to help support the, uh, support the vaults. And here I have a picture where you see uh, Amiens and Cologne Cathedral looking down the nave, uh, both very, very tall and slender, the emphasis on verticality, the supports are slender. Uh, you have your three-story uh, you know, church with your arcade, your triforium, your clair story. Uh, so what? very much the influence of the French Gothic or the Ranet architecture now has come to Germany. Uh, you're looking up, you have the glazed triforium, which we talked about before, where you have you know, the openings, and then there's a little space, and then what would be the outer wall would have uh, windows. So you've got windows at all three levels, behind the arcade, behind the triforium, and then of course right up uh, on the nave wall is the tall Claire story. Uh, you look up and you can see the transverse arches going across, and then the ribs uh, crisscrossing diagonally uh, to form quadripartite ribbed vaults for each bay. And uh, they talk about how very, very thin the supports appear to be. They're obviously very, very strong uh, when you get down particularly to the east end uh, to the choir. Uh, some people even call it a screen, you know, so mostly glass is what you see. Uh, and the wall seems to dissolve, but these, these huge windows, as you can see. Now, this particular type of church, you know, very, very famous, uh, very, very beautiful uh, and, and you know, incredibly grand. It's not the usual type of Gothic church you see in Germany. The Hall Church is actually more popular. We also want to look at some of the sculpture in the nave. If you look on the, the colonnettes that surround the compound piers, you see facing into the nave these little pedestals that are attached to 14 of the piers of the nave. And on each one of them is a different statue which represent Christ, the Virgin Mary, and the 12 apostles. And we're going to look a little bit more closely at Christ and Mary. So here you see them. You see how they would be uh, placed on the uh, pier, the piers of the arcade. And these date to about 1320. So now we're in the 14th century. And they continue that courtly style that we've already seen in uh, French Gothic churches that, you know, both in the 13th and 14th centuries. Um, this elegant, elongated figures with the exaggerated sway of the hips, the hip shot position. Uh, so the hips sway to one side, giving you this beautiful sort of arc of the body, uh, curving form. And then you have these uh, very complex drapery folds. Uh, the draperies swirl up to what the, uh, the edge of the hip, the rising hip. Uh, in Christ's case, he's holding the orb and cross, showing he's the ruler of the entire universe. Uh, and then on both cases, the draperies uh, cascade down with these uh, very complex curving hemlines. Uh, and you can also see so the swing of the draperies in the, the upper top, up, swing of the draperies in the upper part of the body. Uh, so the diagonal folds call attention to the way the body is placed. And I want to show you uh, one more group of statues. I don't have the picture of all of them, but I can show you four of them. Uh, and these are in Naumburg Cathedral. These are the choir statue of the Margraves. Now the Margraves were the aristocratic rulers of this section of Germany. Uh, and so they are the rulers, and they also were the patrons of the cathedral. We're going to look at these um, statues, which date from about the middle of the 13th century, about 1245 to 60. 
So these were not created when these people lived. Uh, they are the ancestral statues. Um, the bishop, Dietrich of Witten, built the choir as an expiation, a chapel to expiate the sins of his ancestors, and possibly himself too. Uh, and so, you know, some of them were not the most virtuous people in the world, but he has created, stat he, was, he has ordered the sculptor to create statues uh, that essentially are imaginary portraits of his long dead ancestors. Um, their appearance is not known. The sculptor gets to make them up, I guess. Uh, he, he may or, you know, maybe he had models, uh, but they are not the people whom they're representing. So they're imaginary portraits. They have, and he gives them imaginary characters, which I find really interesting. We'll take a look at them. Um, the four uh, statues we're looking at are the husband and wife groups. Oh, and where are they? They're in the choir. Um, and they stand around as though, as though they are attending a perpetual mass. So they need to, ex, you know, their sins need to be expiated by the mass, and it's as though they are physically present in the statues, in a sense. Uh, and they, ha they have their names, they're, they're labeled here with uh, Eckhart and Uta, and Hermann and Regalindus. And, you know, they look extremely natural. They look, you know, like I said, they, it looks like they could be real people, even though they may not represent the actual people they are uh, impersonating uh, at all. Uh, you might also notice something about Uta here. Um, she's got this uh, cloak that she draws up, you know, like, I mean, she's not very friendly, <laughs> uh, but she draws it up to her to her chin and this very high collar uh, and, and surmounted by a crown. Uh, and then the draperies cascade down on the other side. Um, it seemed to me that that is the statue that uh, inspired the Disney cartoonists uh, showing the evil queen in Snow White. Uh, very similar costuming. You'll notice that the men are holding shields. They were warriors. Uh, you weren't much of a ruler if you weren't a warrior, to be perfectly frank. Let's take a look at Regalindus. Regalindus bears a surprising uh, similarity to the smiling angel of realms, which really does say to you not only the, the uh, Gothic style of architecture was international, certainly the Gothic style of sculpture was international as well. Um, and you'll notice that uh, that she's, she's grinning, <laughs> she's in a smile, she's got these uh, lovely high cheekbones, she's got the, uh, the, the, the same grin that the smiling angel does. Uh, and, you know, you had that very elegant figure of Uta, and here you have another figure with a entirely different character. Everybody else is solemn, but she looks like she's, she's, uh, she's got a sense of humor. <laughs> she's going to be happy to maybe to be there at Mass. Um, and she may be thinking interesting thoughts, too. Um, it is the same courtly style as the Ram's Smiling Angel. A similar pose. You know, that's how the drapery... Uh, wraps around uh, the arm uh, and is caught by the other hand and then cascades downward very elegantly as well as the the face which is you know, has so many of the same characteristics so uh, we certainly see the spread of uh, the uh, the gothic figural style for uh, now, we see this with Madonnas, we see it with saints, uh, angels, we see it here with uh, uh, imaginary portraits, as it were. Sl slender, elegant proportions, delicate features, uh, the same kind of pose where they're swaying to one side, that hip shot position, the smile with the high cheekbones, and the graceful cascading draperies. French 
and German figures with similar characteristics.